kia koto na mauna, na awa, na waka, na tupuna o Aotearoa. E te whenua moi moia, e hui hui mai nei, tēnā koto katoa. To you, the mountains, the rivers, the waka, and the ancestors of Aotearoa and the land of the dreaming that are gathered here, and those of you from further afield, greetings to you all. Now my harimai piki mai, warm Pacific greetings from Te Whanganue Tara, Wellington, New Zealand, Aotearoa. Ko Sydney Chef Taku Inua. I'm one of the AI for Lamb Australia, New Zealand Chapter Coordinating Committee members beaming in from Waitiata Press, Te Whareta, or Waitiata, or Te Heranawaka, Victoria University of Wellington. We welcome you all and start our day with a karakia uh, suitable for the land of the winds that we know as Wellington. Sorry, Sydney, you're accidentally muted. Pakataka te hao ki te uri. Pakataka te hao ki te tonga. Kia mā kina kina ki uta. Kia mā tara tara tiki kai. E hi ake ana atakura. He tio. He huka. He hauhuna. Hauye. Huye. Takie. Get ready for the westerly. Be prepared for the southerly. It will be icy cold inland and icy cold on the shore. Scarlet dawn rises over ice, snow, and frost. Let us face it together. Tenekoto katoa. Over to you, Ingrid. Oh, kia ora. Sydney, that was beautiful. You've made my skin prickle. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Ingrid Mason. I'm the co convener of the AI for Lamb regional chapter in Australia and Aotearoa, New Zealand. I'm beaming in uh, to this call from Ngunnawal country. I'm based in Canberra. It's also adjusted, uh, adjacent to Nambri country. It's uh, a mild day here, which is a good thing for Canberra because it can be pretty extreme. And I'd like to celebrate with you the enduring connections of culture and people on this continent and the connections across the Tasman Sea to my home uh, and the Pacific, my home, uh, Aotearoa, New Zealand. We are meeting online from across the region to share our expertise, to foster best practice cultural heritage, and learning from each other is always awesome. Learning and appreciating culture is for all, and wisdom and deep knowledge lives through our elders, and I'd like to offer my respect to elders past and present, and to emerging leaders, and for anyone on the call uh, of Indigenous background, um, a great welcome to you. Please share uh, where you're dialing in from today in the chat, and this will help us reflect on culture and place and language as well. Today we have some great speakers, and I'm going to announce them uh, momentarily. But um, I'd just like to make sure that everyone on the call um, mutes their mic so that we can crack on with today's session. Today is uh, going to be a session on AI planning and experiments, and we have two great speakers with us. And I'm just going to do the introductions. We have Abby Potter. Um, thank you, Jessica. Good to have you here. Uh, Abby is a founding member of the LC Labs team and leads our program of digital experimentation with an emphasis on practical and human-centered outcomes. Since joining the Library of Congress in 2005, she's helped build capacities in local, national, and international networks of libraries, archives, and museums. And in the past year, she's led the creation of the LC Labs AI planning framework. And um, Abby's going to share that today. Uh, AI quality evaluation guidance. And she's the current co-chair of the AI for Lamb Secretariat, which is great. She's got a background in digital publishing, digitization, digital preservation, computational access. And she's got a master's of science and in information from the University of Michigan and in archives and human-centered interactions. So we've got a real banger with us today, everybody. And it's great to have so many of you on the call. Margaret Warren, we have here from the State Library of Queensland. She's the Director of Content Management there. And uh, Content Management is responsible for the strategic management and preservation of the library's physical and digital collections. Margaret's also worked in library systems, strategic planning and discovery services with a focus on innovative ways for collections to be made accessible for use and reuse. Uh, we were actually just chatting about the reuse of music material, which is no small thing when it comes to copyright. She's an advocate for copyright reform and creative commons and the role of libraries 
as open access champions and the uptake of AI technologies for accessibility and making collections available as data. So two people with lots of experience in the field and we're going to get Amy to do a brief talk and we're going to get Margaret uh, to talk about a couple of the experiments. And if you have questions or comments, please pop them into the chat and we'll try and loop that through today's session. So Abby, if I may hand over to you to share your slides to get us rolling. You'll just need to unmute, sorry. All right, thank you. Uh, can you hear me now? All right, uh, let me put this on. Sorry, I was not. Okay. Are you all seeing my slides? Yes. Okay, great. Um, thank you so much for um, inviting me here today. Uh, I'm, uh, uh, this is kind of a reprise and update for, um, to a presentation I gave um, at the last Fantastic Futures meeting in um, Vancouver. Um, and it's about our um, AI planning framework. And we um, have, we release it on GitHub. There's the link there. Um, it uh, And we just updated that link. So if you haven't seen it, been, um, we, we made it a little more accessible um, and uh, usable, the, the framework. And it and even though it's on GitHub, it's not code. So these are mainly Word documents and and worksheets that you can um, work through. Uh, because I think uh, you know planning for AI is um, is not very much different than um, what librarians, archives, museum professionals have had to do um, when uh, confronting all of you know lots of other kinds of digital transformations that have come our way digitization, um, uh, digital preservation. I think our, uh, what we know about uh, adapting to those technologies, I think are very, uh, very much applies um, to AI. So the framework that we have um, is, uh, it, it comes from a place of wanting to use this technology. So our, our um, when our, or our little department started LC Labs, we were very focused on um, the needs of computational users, so users that may um, uh, that may use our collections not in a one to one way, but in a in a sort of um, in a in in a way that was sort of assisted by computers and computational methods, and um, taking advantage of of digital collections and and what those new affordances would do. So that's where we sort of started from, and um, we were seen a consistent need for more met more metadata more granular metadata about our collections to connect them to what people um, wanted to do with them and, and to for just plain discovery so um uh, that need for additional metadata um is what started us down this path and we started um uh thinking we started doing experiments, um, demonstration projects. Um, we ha had held an event. Um, we have a grant program, and and it kind of has culminated so far in this um, in this framework. And like I said, it's also it's built on the the um, digital practices that we we sort of have already around digital digitization, digital preservation, um, and. Um, and also this sort of came out from momentum that came that you know was in the world, um, especially after Chat GPT came out. This kind of uh this preceded Chat GPT, and we were really glad we had it. Um, but uh there's also from the U from the United States government, there there's a lot of um federal guidance and um executive orders from the from the president about how to that um the the government needs to consider AI and NIST also, which is the National Institute for Standards and Technology, which is the agency in the federal government, they came out with a trustworthy AI framework. So that, that all of this sort of fed into creating it. And we sort of break it down when we think about machine learning into these three elements, um, data, model, and peoples. And um, machine learning is very sort of data centric. It's, it's built on processing data, um, and in our context, a lot of it is um, our content, so our collections that have been digitized or born digital, um, and that these this data can be 
um, uh, training data, it can tune data, it can validate models, um, it, it output out machine learning outputs data. So, um, but all data is sort of not created equal, as as we all know. So, um, the um, there's still a lot of uh, work that has to be that go goes into preparing data for machine learning, um, and that we sort of talk about that as data readiness sometimes. When we think about the model, we sort of use that as a short term short um, term for um, you know the 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 technical parts of machine learning, and we we can think of it as you know the the model could be a tool, it could be a platform, it could be you know a, a place in a workflow, um, but uh, and there are specific things about the model and how it processes data that we that we want to know about. So we want to know um, uh, what kind of architecture it's using, um, at what kind how it's trained, um, what sort of libraries are are utilized when we're um, uh, libraries of data are utilized when it's to, when those models are being tuned. So we want to know something about these models and how they perform. And then we also want to, of course, center people. So people are represented in data. They create the models. They are their their labor is represented in in different workflows. Um, and people also design and um, uh, the 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 models. Um, so and are and are ultimately responsible for the output and, and how they're implemented. So we always think about these um, elements um, when we're sort of thinking about how we may want to use AI to advance our goals. So this is the the framework. Um, there we have three different phases: understand, experiment, implement. Um, mo most of where we're living right now is in understanding and experimenting. Um, we have not moved to implementation um, through our process yet, um, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. But we we have a pretty high bar for um, for uh, how we how we want the, um, to uh, implement AI in in our context, and then we also have existing governance and policies that that um, are still very relevant, that are still very um, applicable to these um, newer tools and approaches that um, we have to adhere to. These, these still apply. Um, uh, so this is a, a sort of zooming into those three phases, understand, experiment, and implement. And like I said, we spend most of our time in the understand and experiment piece. So, um, and, in the framework, we have different tools that um, support each of these activities. And in this first sort of phase of understand, we're we're um, we're collaborating together. We're 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 talking together in groups. We're sort of taking a look at what what data we have and what needs we have. And um, and um, when any anybody ever asks me what is the first thing that we do, you know, when we consider AI, how to implement AI, and I always say start with the principles and in, in your values. So if you have a clearly articulated sort of um, principles and values of how you want AI to um, to operate or technology in general operate in your organization, um, it, that will really help you guide your decision making when you when you move on. So. I'll talk more about these little, these tools in a second, but then um, after we sort of understand our use case or how we might want to use AI, um, then we move to experimentation. And and in our in our situation in our lab, we had a sort of uh, an experiment process already, um, and and we're using it for this too. In the in the basic sense that we are, um, you know, trying to research a specific question or um, a specific use case and with AI we're, we're, we're testing specific data with with our with specific models and then we're reviewing the output of of that um, process with our staff and sometimes our users usually right now it's mainly staff um, and uh, we're doing that because we need to build a baseline of expectation a baseline of quality for uh, for um, applying AI to certain workflows. So for example, we're um, we're doing exactly that for an experiment we're doing now to see if we can um, use machine learning to produce mark records or catalog records from eBooks. So we don't have um, a baseline quality metric for that. 
Um, so we're, we are currently testing, we ask that we're working with vendors and we're testing five different models to see if, um, you know, what is a quality baseline for that with the, with the tools we have now. Um, and then we sort of do it over and over again as we learn more. And I'll talk about that. And the sort of things that are coming out of this step in the process are documentation and practices around how we may um, evaluate uh, uh, how machine learning is working or AI is working. And we use experiment because of our context, but other people use words like prototype or pilot um, or research. So th I think that that sort of the basic thought is that you want to verify that something works before you go ahead and implement it or um, and that's sort of what we're trying to draw out here. And then when we get to the implement stage, this is, like I said, we haven't done this yet, um, uh, but we want to implement AI according, you know, not just because it's AI, but we want to implement it because it supports our, our overall strategy, our overall sort of roadmap for, for technical in investments. Um, the costs are very kind of unknown at this point. So um, it's important to think about all the other sort of priorities that 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 are out there um, and what AI is capable of doing now. So you really do want to have a strong strategy in a roadmap. Um, and you and um, the the skills and capacities, I don't think these are brand new skills. We don't all have to be data scientists. I think libraries, archives, museums, professionals, we we know our data really well. We know the use cases really well. Um, and um, we can apply that to 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 machine learning also. But we have to make sure if we want to implement this, uh, these technologies at a sort of wider scale, then we we have to have people that can that um, can can sort of follow the process all the way through. And then we also want to have a shared quality standard for for some tasks um, like OCR or um, metadata extraction. We we there's probably some shared shared standards there, much like we have shared digitization standards and shared quality standards around um, what is good enough for um, a certain type of content um, or what the range of good enough is. And, and I think that's something we can work together on. And then I think probably most important for AI is a strong monitoring and measuring um, program that, uh, that will need to be in place because with the, the the way that models are designed, more data will sort of change the performance of those models and it may make them better and it may make them worse, the sort of output. So, so monitoring over time and, and gathering feedback and integrating feedback from the community um, is also a really important aspect of implementation. So it's it's a it's a high bar and it's it's a lot of additional sort of um attention that will be needed to implement these things at sort of a broad scale. Um, these are some of the tools that you'll find at that framework link. The um, uh, Articulating Principles Workshop, a data assessment um, canvas. Um, and then we have this acquisitions vehicle, um, which I can talk about if there's questions, and then a data processing plan, which is something that we're requiring vendors in this work to document exactly what they're doing in terms of what models, what data, how that how the data may be labeled, things like that. Um, at the so this risk case as assessment worksheet, this is um, just parts of it. So we we're asking um, this is meant for self assessment. So this is when people come to office and say we want to do we want to use AI to 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 do this. So this is the first thing we give them, and it sort of goes through and asks them questions about you know, how, where, um, how would you train this model? Does this, what is the current quality standard for this workflow? Um, who are the stakeholders involved? Are any of these people um, um, it, that are involved, are, are, are they vulnerable? Are you, um, what would, you know, are there permission requirements for using their data, that kind of thing? Um, and then more about the data, is this data copyrighted? Does it have personal information in it? And, and if you sort of answer yes to a lot of these questions, um, the risk heightens. So um, this so this is an example of an assessment result from, um, from that worksheet. So if you answer mostly A's, then you're in this very high risk use case category, 
which um which that doesn't mean you can't do it, but it means that they're, you know, plan for significant research, plan for significant testing before you implement it. Um, and then it sort of goes down into a low use, lower risk use case. So you're using all out of copyright materials. You're using, um, you know, you, you, uh, you, you know exactly what your data might be trained on or what your model might be trained on. So, um, so you know, this has been implemented somewhere else. So this, this is kind of in the low risk use category. So maybe you can just purchase a tool through your through your methods. The ones that we're experimenting with are in this B category. Um, the so this is one of our current experiments. I just wanted to um it's this is the mark creating mark records from ebooks. And um I wanted to emphasize here the 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 sort of importance of sort of creating those starting principles and and in those principles we our goal was to to support the catalogers in their work not not to replace them and move around them but those catalogers are responsible for the quality of those mark records these mark records are you know the access the back going to our access system so it was important to sort of put set catalogers at the center um this is the data that we were using that we used in the first phase of the experiment. Um, and then this is kind of the, the quality that we were looking at. So this is um the, the the contractors thought that using different methods now we might be able to get to an 80% accuracy scale. So that the 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 machine was able to match what a cataloger did 80% of the time. Um, but our quality standard for these records are a 95% accurate at least. So we can see that we got there with some, but not all um, models that were tested. Um, and and the, the ones that we did get high results for, um, well, you can see here what we, there, there, there are reasons um, like genre terms. We only had that present in our in our ground truth data in 14% of the records so that performed very poorly um and then also looking at creating subject catalogs the we only got a like 18% accuracy score or matching what a cataloger did and there's lots of reasons for this um mainly because mainly because we have way we have a lot of um subject um terms to choose from uh and it's a very hard problem but um you can see it sort of brings up a lot of interesting questions about cataloging and how we do it, and um, at uh, and uh, you know some may not some of what the cataloger created or what the machine generated, you know, might be acceptable but not exactly accurate. So there's a lot to pick through here. Um, we also tested sort of what okay if we're not going to get meet our our threshold for accuracy, then and then um, we're looking at a human in the loop type of situation where where um, how can the machine how can the the tools support our catalogers, um, and so we we were looking at prototypes like this. So if we um, this is sort of the generated um, term, and then the cataloger can sort of select um, looking at different there's different options here for different information to help them select. Uh, a, a subject. Um, this is that data processing plan I, I've mentioned. So this is kind of, I, I highlighted shared requirement because I think this is something that we could work on together, you know, some sort of documentation requirements that, for ourselves, for vendors, um, and then shared requirements also around assessing quality. So for this experiment, we had this sort of quantitative measure of the model performance. So the F1 score is a, you know, quantitative measure. Um, then we're also looking at the qualitative score of, of the different, these are models, different models that we tested, and we can sort of score things qualitatively around how easy is it for us to use and know about the training data, how much compute cost does each, does each model take, um, how developer friendly is it, things like that. Um, but then we can also look at our program evaluation factors and things and, and how well does the does the outcome of these of these tools help support our 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 broad principles and values so around authenticity risks and reputation risks what 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 do these programs sort of um uh how do they affect those and this is just sort of another way to assess quality that we're still working on actively 
Um, and I highlighted a shared because um, it's something I think we should work on together. Okay. This is fantastic. So Thank you. That was epic. <laughs> yeah. um, I, that's why I enjoyed this the first time around. I'm enjoying it the second time around. Abby. <laughs> There's so much um, depth of work there. I um, really appreciate that. Um, as uh, we now move to the second speaker, we've got um, Margaret on the call. Margaret, if you can unmute um, yourself uh, and tell us a little bit about your experiments. Uh, and if we have a bit of time left, we'll go to Q&A. Um, thank you, Hugh, for the feedback in the chat. Um, I agree. It's terrific work that the Library of Congress have done. So, Margaret, over to you. Let's hear about Thank the you. experiments. Thanks, everyone. I'm just getting my screen to do what it meant to be doing. So, because I'm just going to talk you through a couple of the, um, a couple of some projects, uh, some, I guess, experiments that we've been doing um, in this space, um, both with, um, uh, both with uh, machine learning and with um, some early work with generative AI. So I thought it, it rather than I, I'm going to try and whisk through it really quickly because I think we've all got so many amazing questions already for um, for for you, Abigail. So I can't wait to be to hear what those questions are. Um, oh, need to get to my uh, get to my tab so I can show through. Look, we've been doing some we've been doing work in the um, I guess in the in the field of. Um, machine learning um, and for some time now, but where we really um, where we've really been um, spending our time is in the world of HTR, so 19th century handwriting, um, and how to use um, HTR text, uh, sorry, HTR layers to help um, transcribe and make material from the 19th century that is important for our historical understanding of um, who we are and where we have come from, and particularly in our Queensland context to help us understand First Nations experiences um, um, in, in different ways um, and to help us with the process of truth-telling and reconciliation. So we've been, um, so the, to quickly give you like a two-minute summary, anyone who works in Australia, the, who lives in our context, the colonial secretary was the grand poobah um, of um, management of all matters to do with the government um, in the in the colonial life of um, Queensland. For us, that starts around about 1822 um, to 23, 24, that sort of time, so 200 years ago. And um, we have around 42,000 frames or 16,000 pieces of correspondence um, that we digitised from microfilm, which was the only way it could be accessed, and then have run HTR layer over that text and now working with an amazing um, group of um, volunteers to review that HTR. One of our, I guess, one of the early bits of experimentation for us was actually to look when we were looking at different HTR models of was what was the what was the success level and um, in terms of you know how did it go about um, doing you know translating this handwriting and I'm just showing you one as as an example there. It's pretty hard to read. Um, and because it was digitised off microfilm, we've got low contrast, we've got bleed through the back of pages, we've got whole manner of things. But our but our experiments initially showed around about a seventy percent accuracy, um, which we I actually thought was quite extraordinary. Um, although depending on your discipline, a person would say, "Well, that's completely unacceptable." So it's probably one of our learnings, you know, is that there might be different measures depending on the content. But I actually one here was one where it's actually quite easy to read if you can see that um, text in. So we're now actually working with um, uh, From the Page, which is the, the group that we've been working with for our volunteer transcription. And they're um, going to be implementing um, an AI assist where you don't need to have, so previously we had the HDR um, created and then the volunteers are correcting that. They're going to be, they're experimenting with having um, the HTR as an AI assist to help transcribers. Is it this word or is it that word or is it this other word? So that's a really interesting, what I think is a sort of a low bar piece of work um, for us. Our end game with this project is to be able to have um, the capacity for 
researchers, member of the public, uh, members of the public, family historians, people who are doing a whole range of different sorts of research tasks to be able to inquire across this entire collection. At the moment, you've got to work your way through a finding aid. Um, and mainly what we've done is to move this content online. Um, there are some amazing indexes um, that have been created by volunteers over 20 year periods. Um, and we've been able to um, transpose both the um, that index and the um, transcription to provide individual letter discovery through the catalogue. So that's been a really neat piece of work. But the thing that we're most interested in is our next step is how do we how do we make it available much more broadly. So that's sort of an early piece of work that we've done. Um, I just want to show a couple of other um, pieces that uh, we've been experimenting. Um, this is perhaps, uh, I suppose it is, I guess it's using large, um, large sort of um, machine learning tools to help us interrogate um, our um, collections or collections related data. This is a project called the Topography of Searching, which was done by our Digital Collections um, Catalyst Fellow. And what he did was to map 10 years worth of um, catalogue searches um, and to do that um, to provide uh, a mapping where people can um, look for, there's a, there's a very fantastic um, introduction here, um, so that people can then overview um, by year, by hour, by day, by month, and then and they can look at three-dimensional maps that look at different sorts of search terms over time. And then there's a little bit of um, uh, emotion, um, sense, motion, uh, emotions and things like that in it. So if I'll just do a quick example here, because it's really good to do live searches. Um, if you live in Queensland, the thing that we're most interested in, one of the things is natural disasters because we live in a world of natural disasters. So we can see, um, and we've collected extensively on floods um, and, and we've also had for our um, overseas um, members uh, of this conversation, we've had multiple floods. Um, we've had three once in a century floods in the last five years. Um, and um, gradually this will build up a map that shows over time and also shows by peaks and troughs, come on topography of search, um, the different types of um, search that has been done. Also, um, also related searches. Oh, it's still doing Richard Bell there. Um, also related searches. Um, and so you can sort of see what people are searching terms with and how that is helping them. Our catalogers have really loved this because we found out what people are searching for that are absolute fails. So here's an example of um, the sort of the little topographical map that shows how many searches were done in 20. Uh, 2022 we'd had a flood in 2022 we had a flood in 2021 uh, we had a really big flood in 2011 and 2012 and so that's um it gives us a sort of a perspective of how um how different searches have been done over time that was another sort of one that did a sort of a machine learning thing um our, probably our two most um interesting ones and one where we've had some real learnings about things when you have bad and malicious actors working in this space so last week we um, we've been working on a, a project to have um, um, uh, a generative AI project where we have um, Charlie, who's a virtual veteran, um, to help school students and visitors to our Anzac Square galleries understand more about World War One, so 1914 to 1918. So we worked using uh, using collections material. Uh, collections material um, from our collection. So all of our digitised and transcribed First World War diaries. Um, all of, we use the Trove newspaper archive to bring in second person reporting from that period. And we also worked with the Australian War Memorial to use the CW Bean official First World War histories as the, as the material that would actually feed um, feed the model um, so that people could ask uh, Charlie, the, the the First World War veteran, about World War One. So we went live last week and we'd done extensive testing with different audiences. Um, the only audience we hadn't done extensive tech testing with is malicious hackers who want to do things that um, you can't imagine a person would want to do. And there was um, there was a bit of a takeover by a 
jailbreak um, kind of um, instance that caused us quite a lot of pain in the first 36 hours. Um, and it was really interesting. I think I pick up on your comments earlier on about the need to be really, you just have to go in really aware of the risks that you might be running with this. And this was in a closed model, but then they managed to hack their way and do some, you know, un, un um, unhelpful things like, you know, take over and ask the veteran if he would be an, an elven boyfriend and ask about the war in Gaza, which was actually okay. We had a great answer for the war in Gaza. But um, for the Australian context, we had have had a very... Um, uh, a very controversial um, Victoria Cross winner, um, Ben Robert Smith, and we had a person asking questions about Ben Robert Smith, even though it's about uh, meant to be about World War One. So there were some really interesting learnings, and we continue to learn about about the things that we didn't even think you needed to think about. Um, and despite getting support from the chief Queensland government chief information officer and everyone really being on board with it, we've had to do quite a lot of um, yeah protection of this resource um, from people who intentionally went to do bad things with it. Um, and the other one I, I just want to quickly talk about, because I think um, the question and answer will be really interesting. Um, this is another experiment we did. We have a, a digital catalyst um, fellowship here. And in the last 12 months, we awarded it to a staff member who was really interested in text to speech models. And his proposal was that he really wanted to see if it would be possible to have a text to speech model that would accurately replicate the Queensland accent. Um, and so we all know most, you know, sort of most voice to text models, um, you know, don't necessarily have a Queensland accent where we go up at the end of every syllable and we have particular ways of speaking. So what he did was to use um, a whole range of models, actually, probably going through um, the process that you shared in your slides earlier around um, working out how whether it was actually possible. And so it was possible and he did um, he did actually um, have an, you know, we've got an experimental model. It's a female voice um, model that actually does a not too bad um, text to speech model with a Queensland, uh, a Queensland accent. Just noting that all of the resources that we used for this were ones that were um, copyright free, but we haven't really, we haven't um, progressed to anything further than talking about this as an experimental exercise, because I think there's lots of um, moral rights and other issues that might sit um, in the landscape around the use of something like this um, to, yeah, for, for a whole range of purposes. So I think one of the great things about having something like a collections catalyst project is that you actually have permission to fail. You have permission to actually develop, well, this is what I learned in this. This is what our um, iterative steps are. And this is what we want to do next. Um, I'll, I'll share all of these links. There were some really interesting, um, our catalyst wrote for quite detailed blog about um, his work of assessing which um, machine learning models he would use, which text to speech models he would use, how we would host it all, and looking at collections as models for this type of work. That was a, an, another really interesting project. So I sort of feel like we've moved from um, the sort of what I think the um, you know, OCR, HTR, which is, I, I think, the entry level work in these sort of machine learning pieces um, and actually taking a slightly different tack to the work, the, the work that we've seen today, which is really looking at very exciting things from my perspective is how AI can then move into um, into helping us with our work. And we've been really looking at how can it build rich digital experiences for our clients in ways that are you know, sort of interesting and new and provide um, different experiences than people might have had before. So I think I'm going to stop there because um, it's just a really quick overview and, um, yeah, hand back for questions. Oh, Margaret, that was terrific. Thank you for sharing um, both the beginning um, of your experiments right through to what's happened recently. Mm -hmm. We've all been very focused on seeing um, what occurred um, and for being candid about that because um, failing is part of the process yeah. and um, understanding the risk is uh, part of the process. 
And um, so I'm just going to invite those on the call who have questions to pop them into the chat. But um, in listening to you both, um, I'm very, uh, very compelled by something you said, actually, Abby, which you said about establishing the baselines of quality and expectation mm -hmm. as a precursor to operationalization. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if you two wanted to have a bit of a chat about that because of the evaluation that you've both been undertaking. Um, yes, well, I think, I mean, I think, um, yes, sort of, if it, yeah, there's two sorts of evaluation I'm really thinking of. One is sort of the evaluation of um, what you're actually trying to, was it successful? And I think, you know, in terms of, you know, that research question that you asked, you know, can we, can AI help develop a good mark record for an ebook? Um, I think, you know, I think when we actually, uh, inquire and have those questions then that helps us say well what would success look like and you're very able to say what success would look like there um, and I think that's probably it I think it's incredibly important because we're iterating through a, a time of rapid change so what success looks like for us now may not be what success looks like in 12 months time but at least if we can look at we can then re-interrogate that that research question and its answer of what success would look like and say, okay, 12 months on, do we have a different question or do we have the same question and are our success measures different now because the technology has advanced? Actually, mm -hmm. you were touching on this, Abby, with that point about monitoring. Do you want to jump in? Yeah, I think the um, it's, it's we're, we're diving deep into sort of trying to establish um, you know, from a cataloger's perspective, for example, what what is a quality threshold for, um, you know, for them, some things is straightforward, but for things like subjects, it's it's not. That's a subject, subjective sort of exercise in the first place. So um, it, it's, a, it's a complicated thing to do. So um, I, I, but I think the point about it changing is 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 exactly right. And I think the and using the, these evaluations and baselines as a tool for for all of us, and if we can share what what we think of as quality for for specific uses for specific users, would be really helpful. Um, the uh, our um, and and I think always trying to map it back to what what is our end goal in 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 in, in even doing that mark record experiment. It's because you know our born digital acquisitions are getting larger and larger and larger while the number of catalogers are not so how how can we deal with this problem and and it's brought us to you know um to where okay this that we can't rely on automated methods um wholly so how do we use these tools to support what our experts need so do they need this kind of information and where and can we where in the workflow can we apply these tools knowing that um you know we'll have to check and that really that like leads to a whole regime of quality assurance and then monitoring which you know we have some experience in so um but it, it is it's not a you know a one and done quality question it's something to engage on for, for mm -hmm. a long time yeah, this is really interesting. Um, thank you for that. We've got some questions that have come in from the chat. Mm -hmm. So um, I'll take the first one off the pile. And this is from Amelia Rowe. She says, for both speakers, how do you ensure transparency to users about what the AI is and can do and its limitations? Um, I, I might I might go first and talk about, you know, because it's so front of mind at the moment with the virtual veteran. Um, we made it very clear um, in the... Uh, um, in sort of in the context around the project where the sources are coming from. Probably the thing that's most interesting that I didn't share in this is that when the when the the, the chat um, answers a question, it actually identifies the sources in the source material that was used that um, were used to create that answer to that question. So a person who is then looking at it can go and look at the the digitised letter or 
the newspaper article or the section in the First World War official histories from where the um, the model created um, the answer that the veteran made. So that was the that was the real the real thing. I guess our question for that was: Can we ask? Can we create a, a it's it's a chatbot really? Can we create a chatbot that points the that points the person who's asking the question to the source material? that was used to create the answer. So to try and, you know, to draw people back into the collections, a way to expose them. And so we have uh, that we have answered that question, that, that bit's, but yes, we could do that and we can do it successfully. Um, can we make our AI model completely um, secure? We've got some issues with that, but also the context around it. And, and it was, it's so interesting, some of the feedback, it's, it's quite, um, it's quite diverse, and even to the point of the um, the avatar that we created, we actually had twenty seven thousand portraits that were taken from the newspapers during that World War One period of everyone who um, served from Queensland, and we used Hugging Face um, to create a sort of a an image that used all of those because we didn't want it to be a particular person. We wanted it to be a representation. Well, that's been treated both positively and negatively by audiences. Some people say, you should have had a real World War One veteran. And then people saying, yeah, but they're all dead, you know. So there was all of this tension that came around about that. So I think having the context around it, um, we had a lot of context around it. And I think some people reacted actually just to the library's doing this without even actually looking at that next step. So I think because it is such a, it is such a really you know hot topic in the at the moment. I think providing that context to where your data source, what your data sources are, where they are, and I think then also I think in um, just harking back to an earlier question um, related to First Nations data or historical data with bias or data that might have offensive language in it or outdated opinion, you know, outdated sort of views of the world. You need to be really transparent about that at the start because these models. Will Will, they'll only replicate really what's in there. So uh, it's very it was very important for us. This is a first world, this is a 19th, a early 20th century view of what that experience was like, because that's what the source material is. So that'd be probably one of the big things I think we need to educate ourselves. And then if we're doing things with our audiences, make sure that that contextualizing is very front of front of um of view. That's great, Margaret. Um, Abby, I was just going to say transparency has been front and centre for LOC. Do you want to talk about the choice to kind of get everything out in the open? Your well, GitHub, the, et cetera. Um, well, part of it is um, required in some of these executive orders have have established some general operating principles for, for AI in the US federal government. And transparency is always um, in there. And it it comes down to um yes being as transparent and and um and uh rich about what the deep you know content that's being used but also um communicating to users when we you know whenever any output is ai generated is sort of you know first and foremost and then also having and there's all then there's a lot of interesting ways to to do that from like a UI perspective. You can you can show scores. You know you can show sort of um, the machine gives this a seventy percent you know confidence score. You can there and and then um, also in the sort of kind of digital curation lens, you know keeping very good documentation about the data transformations that eat in. Um, we get questions from, you know, digital humanities researchers who want to know exactly how data is processed and, and keeping track of that with, you know, for AI is also very important because there are implications. I think um, uh, Ben Lee has a really great um, article around data archaeology that came out a couple of years ago where he tracks sort of how he used machine learning on our digitized newspapers and and um, the 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 artifact of digitizing, um, you know, from microfilm and what that 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 the sort of quality issues, especially for photographing people with dark skin, how that sort of perpetuated across all transformations and and even in the tool that he created. So that is a really good article to look for, you know, sort of the 
doing the most around that. Um, I um, think it's also important to have an uh, option. Um, you know, people, some people don't, you know, are, don't trust AI and don't want to use it. And, and that's what something that's called out in, um, in the federal sort of executive orders too, is to have a fallback for people or an alternative to, to access um, services that are not, um, you know, sort of powered by AI. We're not really there on, on an enterprise level yet, but that's sort of mm -hmm. something to keep in mind as we go forward. That's great. I think we're going to manage to squeeze one more question in, but um, either of you, please feel free to jump into the chat. Uh, the next one was from Fiona Fieldsend uh, from the National Library of New Zealand. She's interested to hear a bit more about the building of capability and operational infrastructure in place. So, Margaret, you mentioned using Hugging Face, and she's mm -hmm. also asking about the leadership support. And, Margaret, you mentioned the yeah. chief information officer. So um, there's quite a strategic kind of uh, engagement there um, from decision makers mm -hmm. right at the top to mm -hmm. support the buying in of compute mm -hmm. and also cloud. Mm -hmm. um, so I wonder if you either of you could comment on that before we hit the hour and we let Abby mm -hmm. get on with her evening. Yeah. Um, uh, certainly from here, I think, um, you know, there are some um, Australian government principles related to AI and at our sort of executive level, we, we, we have developed some AI principles, which we will, you know, which are sort of guiding our development. They're very similar to the work that Abigail's been doing, but obviously at a lower scale because it's not, um, we're not the Library of Congress, which with its very complex, you know, and huge um, environment that they had, need to operate in. Um, um, but I think, yes, just generally speaking, having um, high level leadership support for that idea of experimentation and um, uh, building that understanding of the the capabilities and also the sustainability of things that we develop um, is probably, yeah, and, and part of that is just making a, a good business case um, for experimentation and really framing what you're going to do with a realistic view. And I, I do, I really, really love um, Abigail's slides, the, the three slides she had about the different processes, because one of the things we, I think with some decision makers, you know, not, not everyone and not in every organisation, they also may come into this situation with, um, I, you know, where they are on the gradation of risk risk appetite um, and where organisations are on the gradation of risk appetite, but also, it, it's you, you need different levels. You can have different levels of appetite depending on the different types of activities with AI. So I suppose that's where you need to start with the things that, um, you know, have got sort of potential for a, a really good return um, and perhaps not so, um, you know, not, not so depend, dependent on reputational risk. So, and working in that space. But I think if we wait until it's a no risk environment that we're, that we're actually not gonna be able to be players in what needs to happen to do everything from the user experience to improve our own workflows. And from my perspective, I'm really interested in that research question because anything that I can do to give our catalogers more time to work on our unique original material collections is going to be something that is of great interest to us. Um, and also then how we then take for our vendors who supply shelf ready material, how are they then perhaps going to be able to use some of these technologies? So we lift the work from that to the work where we really need to have the um, what the guys from people um, from from the page, the people in the loop. So there are all I think the people in the AI loop is the is a really interesting thing which Abigail referred to as well. And that's mm -hmm. part of the way we talk about it and sell it. Yeah, this <laughs> this risk profile, that risk assessment that you created for use cases is a real motto because most people did start at the bottom. Do you want to comment on that? Right. Yeah, I think it's um, a, a lot of our management was were really interested in the, these very kind of complex, high value tasks. Could we use AI to help with these very hard things? And um, and the sort of what we're finding is it, it can help, but it's not really to the quality that a human would do it. So then especially not that you know the library would want to represent it as its own work. So, um, so I think there's if we want to use it for these very high value, high risk tasks, we'll have to you know we'll have to wait or use these tools in different ways. But I think the best area to be is in this sort of research demonstration, you know, sort of understanding the technology, try you know trying it with staff, trying it with users, understanding where. Um, 
you know, what it would be best at, at sort of helping us with. And, and I think there is a lot of possibility there and just being able to play in the comments, we've talked a little, there's some about our innovator and residence program, um, innovators who are using AI in lots of really, really interesting ways. And that I think really can be encouraged and we can learn a lot from, from doing that, not necessarily applying it to our hardest problems right now, We'll have to keep working on that, but um, understanding the technology through actually using it and looking at the output and seeing where it could fit is a good place to be. This is a good segue. I think this might have to be our last question. It's come from Hugh Rundle. Uh, he wants to really understand that that move from implement back to understand. Once the, the planning and implementation is done, something in the model to learn from the process. Um, and Margaret um, has highlighted the issues with the virtual veteran. And he's uh, interested in a formal or structural process to learn from these projects, given the tech is quite new. How do you kind of go from the experiment to, you know, playing back the lessons learned or, yeah. you know, sending well, the message back up the line? We're um, definitely working on that. And the um, and part of that is trying to come up with, a, you know, and that's why I want to work together on it, because um, assessing quality in lots of different ways. So looking at the you know, the quantitative performance and then looking at, and I think in the, um, when you're looking at evaluating models and then the program, that's where you can really um, attach it to those values. So um, uh, lots of people talk about sort of environmental concerns mm -hmm. and goals around AI. And I think that's, you know, building in, you know, we're going to assess models based on how well they, um, you know, uh, you know, how much you know, compute power they use and how much, yep. you know, power in general they use and build that in when you're, you know, sort of developing it and, and, um, and have that be a real true sort of quality measure that gets tracked and then um, is, uh, and, and that, and that's notional, we haven't done that yet, but we're trying to build that into our governance and, and um, by, you know, clearly saying principles, having clear data, privacy, security rules, and then, and then having clear sort of rules around like copyrights, moral rights, other, you know, intellectual property rights that we care about. So having those baked into how we implement and evaluate. That's and I great, think, Margaret. Um, I think just last to word. finish off that, the last word. I think um, that was I was going to mention that sort of sustainability piece. But then for me, there's also the sustainability of what we develop. So you, you've got to evaluate: is this actually going to be a sustainable thing? And you can look at it from um, from an environmental perspective, but you also look at it: do we have the capability to keep iterating? Do we have the do we have the will the tool keep doing its work in the way that it should be doing its work? Is this a sustainable process? Um, particularly if you're looking at workflow improvements, because you might have a lot of people who need to be involved in that workflow and, and they need to be, you know, confident and capable in doing that. So I think there's those two sustainability things we also need to think about as part of the bringing it back into that, evaluating, okay, well, what's the next research question we're going to ask? And it could be, how can we make this a sustainable model? We've succeeded. How do we now make it sustainable so that staff can implement it in their workflows or we can uh, replicate it for a different collection or something like that. Yeah. Thank you. That was great. Um, we're just about coming up to the hour. Um, uh, what I've taken away from this is that we really need to be clear about our priorities and the return on investment with that. And also we need all the eyeballs and the feedback on how to establish that baseline for quality um, and how we actually approach evaluation. So it sort of reminds me of the formative and summative evaluation process that you go through with museum exhibitions, is that you, you need it at both ends to kind of drive that process. I'm sorry, everyone, we've hit 10 o'clock our time. We've hit eight o'clock Abby's time. That was a terrific discussion. Thank you so much. If you could show your appreciation in the chat um, with your reactions, um, I'm just going to do a quiet little clap here. Um, Abby, uh, looking forward um, to seeing you in Canberra in October at the Fantastic Futures Conference hosted by the National Film and Sound Archive and you, Margaret, yeah, and thanks. maybe some of you on the call. Um, the call for papers is still open. I was just about to get the call for papers link out. Um, we've had some proposals come in and um, we may yet extend the deadline for a couple of weeks for people who have been scrabbling trying to get everything else done. Um, but thank you everybody for joining us and for your questions. I'm sorry we didn't get through all of them and terrific to have uh, 
that framework um, put out into the wider community, Abby, because um, and the call to contribute and to give feedback. We really appreciate the generosity in that. And um, I think you've given lots of people food for thought today. So um, we might call it a day there or an evening there and um, say goodbye to everyone. And we hope to see you again soon. Cheerio. Yeah.